Good afternoon. Welcome to the second lecture of Paraswar Sutradhar series organized by the Office of Communications, Indian Institute of Science. Today we have Dr. Subhashree Srinsika to speak and interact with us. We welcome her. The format of the discussion is as follows. Uh, the speaker will give us a brief of her work and life. After this, to facilitate better discussion, we have introduced a discussion for the series. Our colleague Ranjini Raghunath will initiate the discussion. Post that, it will be open for the audience to ask questions. Before we begin, let me briefly introduce the speaker. Dr. Subhashri Desikan is a senior assistant editor with The Hindu. Here she is involved in contributing, editing and publishing articles for the Science and Technology page and Education Plus. She also contributes general interest articles for the news pages and the Sunday magazine of, of The Hindu. After completing a PhD from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai in quantum field theory of condensed matter systems, Subhashri joined as postdoctoral fellow at Harish Chandra Research Institute. After this, she joined as a research uh, associate at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Subhashri was assistant, assistant editor with Orient Black Swan and as Ramasation writing fellow with the current science journal. We are happy to have Subhashri today and request her to take us through her lively journey. Subhashri. Thank you, Bitasa. Uh, since it's uh, hot summer days, I give you all a very cool welcome instead of a warm welcome, as they always say. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy my. I'm going to talk about my life and uh, work, which is kind of uh, strange. Because, hello? No. Uh, uh, Maybe request a, everyone uh, to mute their mics, please. Please continue. Yeah, so it's a bit strange to be talking about myself and my work and all that. Uh, but I do hope that somewhere along the line, we'll strike a chord with uh, each other in this uh, thing. And uh, OK, let me start at the beginning. Uh, some of the early I'll talk about some of my early influences in my life. The first time I encountered science communication was as a kid of about uh, six or seven years when my father gifted me an encyclopedia. My parents gifted me an encyclopedia. It had a lot of uh, science in it, especially astronomy and theories of how the universe began and Big Bang and steady state theories and all that. So one of the things there was uh, about the sun. It, it was about the life cycle of the sun and how the sun did not actually it was not the steady object that we see every day rising in the morning and setting in the night and rising the next day. Uh, it's such a steady phenomenon, but uh, the, the encyclopedia completely shattered that image and it said that the sun would eventually die after uh, 500 million years or something like that. It had its own lifetime uh, as a, it will become a red giant and then it will shrink and then it will collapse and so on. So I was kind of stunned, even uh, th even then I remember being stunned. And this is an aspect that of science communication that I value till today. How you how it unearths to you the most unimagined sort of uh, phenomena that you, you wouldn't even have thought about it, but science communication can reveal it to you. So that's the that I think was the root of my interest in science communication. I, I did uh, take up physics when I uh, grew older. I did an MSc and a BSc, BSc and an MSc in physics, which was uh, did all but iron out the interest. It was so textbook oriented and it was so, uh, MSc was slightly better, but uh, that was the way we were trained. But still there were interesting things. Even during my BSc, I remember getting interested in Debye's theory of uh, specific heat derivation uh, uh, which which uh, which used some very interesting calculations and all that. And uh, later in my MSc, uh, there was there was this notion of complete states and uh, spheric uh, the spherical harmonics, how they were used to calculate multiple moments and so on. So those calculations were really very fascinating and interesting to me. And I decided to take up my research uh, in physics. I joined the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And then uh, I think I entered a long tunnel because it was like a very difficult uh, stage in my life when there were all kinds of challenges. Uh, there was, of course, the challenge of doing research, 
but there was also the challenges of feeling alone and not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel the tunnel was a bent tunnel so i i didn't really see the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, so it was a very long and lonely sort of struggle which i did complete i did finish my phd and uh, i went on to do my postdocs in as vidasa mentioned in harishchandra research institute and iit kanpur but it wasn't getting much better i felt like i was at the end of a road so i had to think of something else to do i tried teaching i taught for a semester uh, and then i uh, joined as a uh, copy editor with a e publishing company uh, where uh, i just thought uh, what, what kind of a change i would like and language was something that i was very confident about because the phd had all but destroyed my confidence in myself by then so uh, when i took up uh, copy editing uh, and then I, f- i still felt i wasn't doing enough i still had a greater potential and so i took up the a job as a publishers editor with orient black swan and there i was uh, editing books by uh, in computer science in mathematics in physics and uh, that really made me made the interest come alive once again uh, you know so i wanted to read more of science and i felt that uh, being a publishers editor was was a good job but it was not really giving me the uh, kind of exposure i wanted to get so then i was really uh, at my wits end i thought thought and thought and i thought writing is something that i could take up because uh, i was interested in uh, writing and reading science very much so i applied for this ramasation fellowship with the with the bangalore indian academy of sciences and uh, there was an interview process and i got selected and i felt like i had been given a great award because it was such a pleasant thing to be wanted after a long time and uh, that was like a turning point i i reached the bend of the tunnel and i saw the light at the end of it i think and i uh, there were many interesting people with whom i, I interacted during my time there uh, professor balram was there from who was a former uh, director of iisc and a uh, uh, biology scientist biologist and um, i had a great uh, experience interacting with him and it was a very in, exp, inter, inspiring experience talking to him and uh, then i got some i used to write for current science and they told me you're free to write for other magazines as well so i uh, wrote for uh, himal south asian which is a online uh, which had a non, which now i think is an online only uh, journal and uh, i enjoyed myself i realized then that Uh, this is what i wanted to do all my life so i wrote for indian express i wrote book reviews for indian express and uh, then i wrote some articles for hindu in school uh, which is a student edition of the hindu uh, then i realized that i really liked writing science uh, for the public so that's when my career got set i think it was a, it was a long uh, circ uh, What, what do you call it a very long winded and uh, convoluted path that i took to uh, reach the point where i really wanted to be but finally i had made it and uh, then i joined the hindu in 2012 and that is the start of a 10 year stint now i complete 10 years this august with the hindu it's been a great uh, journey because i have uh, done so many interesting stories every day is uh, every day i read something new in science and it really helps me uh, keep track of what's happening in the fields and so on so uh, this is my journey from science uh, starting as a science student and making my way to the to becoming a science writer uh, i i got some crucial insights in this process uh, one thing is that uh, you know uh science communicating complex ideas can be quite daunting it's not very easy to 
simplify complex ideas. You you mustn't simplify some ideas, and you need to simplify some others. You need to pull out all the weeds and present only the uh, essence of the matter to the public. That's a great challenge, and it's very daunting too sometimes. Reading a paper can be very daunting when you're not familiar with the field. But uh, that reading that has been a very rich experience also for me to to overcome this. Uh, in inhibition of not reading uh, new science and so on. And then the creative process takes its own time. That's another thing I realized. Sometimes I push the, I have a deadline on Tuesday at four o'clock and I really, I'm sitting at two o'clock, I still haven't written my article. And that last two hours of pressure, sometimes I have noticed that it brings out the best form of writing. Because the pressure forces you to think very simply, and uh, you you just uh, bring out the best the the best articles in the sense that you communicate them uh, most efficiently when that pressure works on you. But it's a it, it's a pain. The pressure is really a pain actually at that time. But then the results can be quite stunning at the end of it. One great reward is that you see your work in print, of course. But there's also another great reward, which is that uh, it offers you, science offers you a beautiful uh, a philosophical perspective on life itself. Like recently I wrote an article about uh, how the, the cell and the mitochondria learn to live together. The mitochondria, as many of you might be knowing, because many of you are science students, uh, is the mitochondria was not always a part of the cell. Before plant cells and animal cells branched off, before multicellular organisms evolved, there were these single-celled organisms called archaea and uh, bacteria were there. So once upon a time, two billion years ago, the archaea swallowed the uh, bacterial cell and the bacteria learned to live inside the archaea. And uh, it kind of, uh, the, the process of adjusting it is, has been discovered recently by uh, scientists from Cell Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad. But this, this was known before that uh, the bacteria and the archaea uh, got together to form a unit. That is known. It's called the endosymbiosis, as many of you may know. And uh, this is a remarkable uh, example to me of how systems always learn to coexist in nature. There's no such thing as you are an alien and so I will destroy you or something like that. There's always a compatibility and there's always a, a sense of coexistence and sharing in nature, which is a great philosophy to live by. Uh, there's no thing as uh, your identity makes you different from me and hence I will not work with you. It's not like that. So. Uh, that is a great uh, philosophical perspective that science gives me. In 2016 and 17, I got an award for uh, a national award for science communication. That was another little reward that I got uh, in my work. Nobody works for awards, but when they come your way, it's quite a pleasant uh, surprise. So. That brings me to the title of my talk, Seeing the Light at the End of the Tunnel. There are there could be uh, long phases in your uh, uh, career or in your uh, PhD career when, when there's no light uh, and you don't really see the uh, success that is waiting for you at the end of the tunnel. But uh, it will definitely happen. Because all you need to do is to change your perspective and change some of the parameters that are working in your life and you will uh, definitely make it there. Uh, I think uh, with that, I kind of come to a close of what I wanted to say. But if there are, if Bitasta and Ranjini, you have any questions, we can start discussions and uh, so on. Sure. Thank you so much, Vashri. Uh, that was uh, really nice. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all your personal uh, uh, journey with us. Uh, maybe we'll just have a few questions that uh, I wanted to ask, and then we can open up the questions to anybody in the audience. Okay. Sure. To start with, do you miss doing research? You know, it's been a long time since you made the switch. 
so do you really miss being in the lab or doing science absolutely i think it's a love that never dies uh, because all said and done the kind of uh, uh, kind of depth of uh, you know working in a field the the, the appreciation of that uh, of the deeps you only get in research and uh, that is something that cannot be compensated by anything else i do miss it a lot but but then the re- i have good compensations i really have a rewarding career that way and uh, that makes up for it and uh, you made the switch to science journalism more than 10 years ago so how do you you've seen how the field has evolved over time how do you how would you say that the landscape of science writing and science journalism has changed over the last 10 years especially in india um i made the switch 12 years ago when uh, online was not such a major player you know internet was not such a major player in science journalism uh, it was mostly print journalism which was uh, 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 uh which was which was a much a very different beast from the internet uh, uh you know science uh, it's it's much faster and the the press, the what what clicks and what doesn't click is very different in print and in print you have a captive audience so that is one major change that i have seen in the last uh, 12 years or so uh the other change is that when i first uh there were science, many science journalists even then but uh, we were all kind of working in our own uh, niches it wasn't now there is a lot more interaction with uh, twitter and facebook and all that and particularly in twitter uh, there's a lot of uh, interaction with with the internet uh, being so friendly uh, so that interaction strengthens people i think there's a lot more room for discussion and all that a lot more opportunities have opened up many more websites where you can write science even uh, i think at that time there were not even that many press information officers in in institutes so that's another job opening which has opened up mm-hmm. there's still a lot more to do lot more to happen i i think but uh, but we are really on the way i think it is it is still evolving and it will continue to evolve for quite some time before it reaches any plateau i don't see it plateauing so soon now okay. yeah. so a couple of people have asked questions but maybe we can get to them just after uh, the two three additional questions that i had sure. um so i mean it's something similar to what one of the questions is similar to what somebody has asked i mean science journalism is a field or a career uh it seems to be picking up momentum recently uh, and uh, there seem to be like you said uh, more writers coming on board many more outlets and so on but given that traditional journalism itself is in sort of turmoil with fake news mis- misinformation and all that what would be your take on what is going to be the future for science journalism what will be the career prospects like say one of the students also was asking so what do you think is the future of science journalism yeah see the thing is that uh... unlike in a programming job or a or a or a teaching profession or something like that science journalism or journalism itself is full of uh, risks only it's it has never had an assured uh, even in the good old times it has never uh, uh, you know one of the one of the famous journalists uh, vinod mehta apparently said uh, that you must always have your resignation letter in your pocket <laughs> if you want to be a good journalist so okay. so yeah so it has never come with assurances and i cannot give any assurances now it's not changed but still there's uh, there's some uh, if you can afford it uh, it's a good game to get into you see it like a game if you can see it like a game it's it's really going to be rewarding that's my take on that uh this also often debate about whether scientists scientists or journalists are sort of better suited to explain science scientists may sometimes feel they know they, they know their field or their work better whereas journalists feel they are they are better suited to explain the work to a lay audience and some scientists are also wary of being misrepresented by journalists so what would be your thoughts on that i i think 
definitely the scientist can explain their work very well his or her work mm -hmm. uh, they are certainly suited to explain because they know it best but then uh, there is also this matter of uh, understanding where the i mean you can just communicate all you like and it can it can go completely over the heads of many people right the, you you need a special skill to and a talent to uh, to come to effectively communicate within quotes because uh, communication is should not be just one way and i think that's where science journalists are trained they are trained to have a finger on the pulse of uh, people to see what is exciting how can uh, it be conveyed uh, properly and so on there are some scientists who are very talented in doing this also but i would say that they are still too close to their own work the the second uh, second aspect is the critical dimension that the journalist brings into the picture because uh, it, when the scientist speaks about their work it's their baby so they are not going to see too many faults in it they will of course be professional and point out the limitations of studies and all that but there is still an there's a there's a limit to that also and so i think uh, i think we should uh, if we are interested in communicating science to the public uh, we must work as a team the and of course there will be some adversarial aspects also uh, when the nobody likes to be criticized and uh, so and another thing is that the third dimension is that uh, the science journalist not only writes about work that's being done in a lab they write about the sociological aspects of science they write about okay. pseudo science they say write about uh, you know uh, projects that are not taking off projects that are harmful in the to the environment for instance they do all kinds of things that uh, scientists don't do so uh, so it's a if you are talking strictly about communicating science then i would say it should work Uh, as a partnership between science journalist and scientist were there any like aha moments in your career when you felt like okay what i'm doing is really worth doing or or something some thing that had an impact or something that you felt really proud of yeah that's a that's a bit of a tough question because uh, when you say aha moment it's not like in Uh, a lab when you pour right. two chemicals in and you get a reaction in the chemistry lab uh, it's right. not like that right uh, mm -hmm. so there are uh, many uh, rewards that you get uh, in science writing which is that you get your name in print every day which is a great uh, immediate response it's not like research where you where you work 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 for several years and then you get a paper at the end of it uh it's much more uh, instantaneous gratification is available in uh, in science journalism but uh, we i have had some aha moments also but uh, every time you try to write about a complex uh, thing that looks very obscure and then suddenly that uh, the whole thing makes sense to you that moment is that little little aha moments are there like that throughout uh and that's a definite uh, pleasure i think in understanding and writing science uh specifically if you want me to tell you something uh, there was a very cute uh, example uh in the sense that i had to interview this uh, nobel laureate uh, arthur mcdonald who won the nobel prize in 2014 i think for neutrino physics and uh, so i got an interview with him which is itself uh, a big thrill and uh, he said uh, one of the questions i asked him was how did you convince people that your uh, observatory is not going to be harmful then he said there was a lot of uh, fear about using heavy water among canadian people so he is a canadian and he is the head of the sudbury neutrino observatory and uh, he said that uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, you know wrong perception among people that the heavy water would be harmful and uh, it contain radiation and things like that so what the scientists would do to uh, allay these fears is they would go to public cold meetings and they would take a glass of heavy water add a dash of scotch and drink it 
in public. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so a lot of amusing things like this you hear every day. Uh, <laughs> so, you see the other side of science, you know, the the public facing side of science you see all the time, which offers, and like I said at the beginning of the talk, the the whole philosophy of coexistence, of not seeing people as Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, and Christian and so on and uh, Jew and so on and uh, seeing everyone as a human being and uh, as a part of the universe which is itself a one big organism it's not it's everything affects everything else today you know about climate change and how that is uh, throwing this in our faces every time so uh, so that that there are moments when you feel that oneness with nature which is which cannot be compensated by anything else I think so that's a lot similar to science, being in science in some sense. Okay. I'll just okay. end with maybe just one question and then there are some questions that have come up in the chat. So I hope okay. I'll bring that up. So maybe what would be one key piece of advice that you would like to give to anyone who wants to? <laughs> I guess it's difficult to just say one, one piece of advice, but if there's something you would strongly suggest for someone who's seriously yeah, strongly suggest, I would never give advice to anyone. <laughs> but uh, but I think uh, and journalists uh, abhor advice. I think. <laughs> okay. So if you want to right. be a science journalist, uh, I think you must uh, first of all eschew the thing of being uh, insecure. You don't have to be insecure because science is such a vast uh, ocean that even if someone has uh, worked very well on a one on one story, there's always another story you can pick up and work on. So that way the choice is infinite, almost practically infinite. And uh, so there's no need to feel insecure. And uh, uh, that that problem you should not have when you're doing science. Uh, you should not feel that someone's, uh, you know, uh, or cracked open the story and uh, uh, they've done better than me. That, that sort of thing you needn't feel. There's always scope for improvement. So. So you can go forth with a, with a confident uh, stride, I think, in science journalism. And one other thing I would like to say is that, uh, particularly for women and other uh, people who are marginalized in some sense, uh, what uh, you must pick your battles. I feel you mustn't. Uh, you must be careful about. Uh, how, what are the battles you pick? It's a, it's a war. If you look upon it as a war, it's not a war, but it's, if you look upon it as a war, then you need to pick your battles and uh, choose carefully what you tackle and how you tackle it. That's a very conservative advice. So I don't know whether it's really necessary now, but uh, anyway, I just said it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have a few questions in the chat, so maybe I'll just uh, read them out and you can answer them. So Zilli has asked uh, on a daily basis, how did you find perspective on what you were doing? Uh, can you just read that out once more? So uh, on a daily basis, uh, how did you find perspective on what you were or are doing? Uh, perspective is something you develop over the uh, years in some sense that some little article can throw up uh, uh, an insight that you never had till then. So it is really a chance thing how these things happen. For example, I told you in the beginning of the when I spoke first, I, I spoke about uh, uh, how the mitochondria learn to live inside the cell and that gives me a perspective of uh, oneness of the universe, how uh, there are nitrogen, I mean, endo symbiosis is not very new. You, uh, there are nitrogen fixing bacteria living in the root nodules of bacteria, of plants. And uh, so the, the whole system lives in a balance of sorts with each person helping the other one to survive. And there are uh, microbiomes inside our bodies and uh, so on. So, uh, this kind of perspective you get on reflecting on what you uh, write and read, seeing it not just as a piece of science, but also seeing something more valuable in it. I think it comes as you practice 
it's a, it's something that you gain with practice. Does that answer your question, Zili? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sri Vaishnavi has asked, I'm currently doing my master's. What are the job prospects for a fresher in this field? I think the way I would go about it is uh, to write a lot of uh, freelance articles, build up a repertoire of articles first. You need to have uh, and then you can. Uh, uh, you can you can also do a course in uh, science journalism or journalism itself. And then uh, approach uh, the the organizations for work, but I would say definitely one way to go about it is to accumulate many articles that you've written uh, as a freelancer. There are many publications now that accept uh, articles from freelancers, provided they are well researched and well uh, written, and uh, so that itself will be a practice for you to. To excel in what you do. Um, Ashish has asked one thing I really like that you just said you have to choose what to elaborate on and what not to elaborate on when communicating with the public. Could you give some examples and the choices that you made in that context? Well, there's all there's a lot of things like uh, today I had to write an explainer on uh, microplastics entering the bloodstream. That's a story that's uh, very recently made the news. Uh, so in that, uh, when writing the explainer, there were many things uh, in the in the in the paper itself. There was there were the type of plastics that they had chosen to. So the study was about uh, identifying microplastics, which they define as uh, plastic particles of a size uh, less than uh, or sorry, greater than 0.0007 millimeters. That is 700 nanometers and above. That's the uh, sort of sizes they are talking about of particles in the blood. And uh, they had uh, looked at five types of plastics, uh, such as uh, PET, PET, and then uh, polyethylene, and so on. So, uh, and then they had uh, they had the method of how they went about it. Uh, and uh, how they took blood from each person and uh, how they put them in uh, containers which were uh, sterile and uh, how they developed the controls. They had to have a blank liquid against whom they against which they tested these to see whether the, this is due to background or uh, these are really trace elements so they can be uh, just uh, lost in the background, so they had to check the background carefully, things like that. So I I left out all the details about how they had done it, and uh, I I explained mainly what it is and uh, how is it relevant to us, as in uh, would it be uh, would such microplastics lead to diseases in the human condition? What has been known about that? And uh, so on. I so I left out the whole thing about how they had done it uh, because that is not what the public really wants to know at that particular point in time. If anyone is, I also have given the uh, the the reference to the particular paper. So if someone is really interested in knowing how they did it, they will go to the paper and find out, right? So every reference is there, but this is how you make a choice between what is. Uh, not necessary, at least what you believe is not necessary and what you believe is necessary. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's that's a great insight. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Prankur has asked, what is the way someone like a PhD student can start stepping into science journalism as a side hustle? Why side? You can make it your main <laughs> thing at this. A oh, PhD student, OK, uh, you can first start reading the subject of your. I think the first place to start would be to read. You re read around, uh, read all the science journalism that is around you. Don't restrict yourself to Indian journalism. You can look, read uh, people from MIT, science, science journalism and uh, so on. You can uh, read all kinds of things. There's Quanta magazine, there's uh, all that. 
so you can read a lot and uh, so when you read you will get a feeling for what subjects really draw you to to themselves so you can then make a choice of what you want to write about because what as a phd student i would imagine the um, greatest uh, stumbling block will be what do you where do you start writing what do you write about so to get an idea of that read well and uh, where you get these little doubts and little gaps you can start filling them in with articles and so on is that uh, okay or do you want to hear some more Rankur, is that does that answer your question? Okay, maybe then I'll go to the next one. Uh, okay. How do you choose? So Piyush has asked, how do you choose to what extent the scientific concepts need to be simplified for the general public? Uh, that is the first. Uh, lim that's a good question actually because it doesn't have an easy answer. Uh, the first limitation is yourself. What you understand best, right? You cannot write about what you don't understand. Uh, you may not. You may understand ten things and write only about nine of them, but you cannot write about uh, ten things when you understand only eight of it. So you need to understand everything that you are putting into your article. Uh, so that is that gives a natural filter of where you stop. But uh, then you make an effort and talk, talk to people and uh, get more insights and understand better, and then you write the rest of it. Uh, so, so the question was, uh, how do you choose what not to? How do you choose to what extent the concept needs to be simplified? Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, I assume that the reader is intelligent but not necessarily knowledgeable. You know, you you think of a very very young person, uh, maybe a, a high school kid, or a, how would you explain uh, the science to them? You would. Uh, they may not be dumb. They may be very smart and very intelligent. So they will pick up when you when you tell. The only thing is, they don't know the world enough. They don't know uh, several things about the world. So when you talk to them, you have to. Define all the new things, and you don't don't use jargon. You that's how you basically simplify. So you have an idea of an intelligent reader who's not uh, necessarily knowledgeable about everything that you're uh, talking about. Uh, the next question is from Meghna. Um, how do you bring about a balance? Uh, I guess it's somewhat similar to the previous question. How do you bring about a balance about how much of the concepts is to be made uh, simplistic? Uh, somewhat yeah. similar. Yeah, balance in the sense uh, there's the word limit if you're writing for print. If you're writing for internet, uh, sometimes there's no word limit. But even then, you're advised to keep it short sometimes. Uh, but it's your voluntary thing. In print, definitely there are very tight uh, limits to the word length you can choose. So that automatically gives you a balance. Within this, you are, then you are forced to edit. Like I, I recently wrote an interview of uh, Abel Prize winner Dennis Sullivan, this year's uh, Abel Prize winner. So I did an interview of him, and uh, the interview was totally 8,000 words long. And then I cut it down to some 5,000 words. And then I begged the editor to give me 2,000 words, but he said, no, it's only for 1,000. We cannot give more than that. So the 8,000 word interview got cut to a 1,000 word interview on print. Uh, and in online, of course, it went as a 5,000 word piece, but uh, in, in print, it was a 1,000 word uh, piece. So uh, you know how, how it is done. Then when, you do, when you do something like this, instinctively, you know which ones to cut, which, which ones not to. Uh, cut which which uh, those particularly for a newspaper reader you you want to keep it as general as possible so all those considerations come into cutting that's how you decide um there's a question from rahul uh, as a science journalist in your experience have you ever faced criticism 
for false information regarding sense but i guess that's uh, yeah no actually no uh, not false <laughs> right. information right right yeah. uh, i may have been fa- i may have faced criticism for uh, jargon once in a way but never for false information right um there's a question from deepika uh, to scientists frequently asked to see your stories even if it is not just about them and uh, what do you tell them in these scenarios um so if i if i'm very sure about what i'm writing i don't uh, show them the transcript mm-hmm. but if i have particularly when i write about bio my subject is physics physics uh, that's the subject i've been trained in but if i write about uh, say evolutionary biology or cell biology or chemistry then i i'm not sure sometimes whether i've got the logic right i try to thrash it out beforehand but sometimes when i have a doubt then i show them either part of my transcript or the entire article uh, to uh, see that I, it's correct because you don't want to uh, convey the wrong information but i try to avoid this as much as possible it's not considered uh, good practice to assume that you will uh, share particularly if a scientist demands to show it then your back is also up you don't want to uh, yield to that so it has to work as a as a cooperative uh, thing sometimes but is the general practice uh, typically just sharing the quotes uh... With, yeah usually the quotes you do share because uh, you don't want to misquote a person but then there's also the deadline pressure like mm-hmm. there may not be time enough to share the quote then the but you have to be very faithful to the uh, to the person who's given you the quote uh, you have to give it really uh, accurately that is that is part of your job so Uh, sometimes there's no time to share it so then we don't so sidrat has asked is there a difference between science communication and science journalism and how does that reflect in your day to day work uh, there's also another question about um, is there a shift from writing to video and graphics and is graphics a necessary skill in the field we'll take one by one the first yeah. question so the first one is what is the difference between is there a difference between science communication and journalism and how does that reflect in your day to day work yeah science communication is when you just uh, it's more like uh, you talk about a particular work uh, communicated to the public uh, your intention is not so much to criticize it but as to uh communicate what has been done you you almost assume the uh the i mean you of course it is even that is goes through a process of vetting uh, where the science journalist has to uh make sure that whatever is said is authentic and so on but uh, given that uh, it's it's given uh, but science journalism on the other hand uh, is a much wider uh, field where you kind of write about uh, you write about institutes you write about the politics happening in the institutes even when you write about a you when you write about a work you don't just write about that isolated uh, work alone but you bring in a perspective uh, you talk to other people you bring in a perspective to how as to how important this work is or how uh, or how it can be improved and so on so journalism is a little more critical than uh, communicating science the other question the so second question was um, is there a shift from writing to videos and graphics and is graphics a necessary skill in the field uh no skill is not necessary you know every skill is essential uh, and in, because it's changing times now and uh, if you are go- if you are going to do podcast for instance you can really make your mark because there are there's a there's a lot of uh, scope and uh, and not enough people doing it well uh, so that's definitely some you can make a breakthrough there so same way graphics and videos and all that uh, if you develop a skill it will definitely come in handy that's all i can say about that um 
if anybody has any further questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand as well. Um, apart from putting in the chat window. So if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to just uh, directly ask or, or raise your hand. Um, there is a question, Ranjini. In the yes, Manvi has asked a question. Um, I would like to ask about the monetary prospects and income in this field in India. Uh, that's a tough question. There, uh, it is not. Uh, I mean, permanent jobs are uh, difficult to get, and the jobs are like very middle income level. So, uh, uh, and freelancing is also very very iffy because you don't know whether you're getting a commission or not. You don't know. So. There are lots of risks uh, in that respect, yes. But then there, there's a lifestyle. Sorry, one thing I want to add is there's a certain lifestyle that you get, which is uh, not easy to get in any other places. The rewards, uh, like in, you may get uh, financial comfort in certain other jobs, but you won't get the uh, excitement of uh, reading something new every day or. Uh, or writing something that uh, people will come and tell you. If you're a TV journalist, people will uh, come and meet you on the streets and they'll tell you, aren't you so-and-so and so on. And uh, even even a print journalist, as I get a lot of, uh, when, my, when I get introduced by my cousin to uh, one of his friends, then uh, the person tells me, oh, I've read your articles and I like them very much and all that. You'll never get that sort of reward, right, in other fields. So it's I, not just about money. I suppose you also get to meet a lot of very interesting. Absolutely. Every uh, every scientist I meet has an interesting story to tell me. And uh, it's really very, very fascinating. Yeah. A lot of room for conversation there and thinking. Does anyone have any further questions? Uh, could I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Ashish. Yeah, um, so I mean, mainly the articles that you write are in English, right? Um, yes. What are your thoughts on community communicating science uh, in Indian languages? I think it's very, very important. And um, some I uh, I don't write in Tamil. That's true. Tamil is my other language, but uh, some of my articles have been translated into Tamil also. I think it's a very important thing and uh, it needs to be done. Yeah. So, okay. For example, your article has been translated in Tamil. So, how did you like? Did you look at it? How did it translate? Like, was it still getting the message through? Uh, yes. Actually, after the person translated it, they ran it past uh, me. They they showed it to me, and I had to read it once and uh, check that it was represented correctly. Uh, it was transformed. It was not a translated article. It was definitely uh, differently written. Um, but that was the expertise of the person who was writing it because uh, the per uh, it's different when you write for an English audience and for a Tamil audience. Because even if you look at science fiction, uh, what passes off as science fiction in uh, English and what passes off as science fiction in Tamil are totally different. So. Uh, there's a there's a way of writing and communicating which needs to be different. So I, I was actually quite happy that uh, they had transformed my article like that and uh, written it. It was a little more dramatized. Uh, it was more uh, engaging and all that. So, uh, but the facts uh, I, I had to check and uh, I had to make a couple of corrections on that, and that was uh, good. Okay. Thank you. Thank. You. Hello, sorry. Um, if there are no further questions, then um, uh, maybe we can uh, should we end the session here, Shubhashri, Vidasta. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to interact with everyone. It was really a lot of fun, and I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you for so much. taking the time to uh, share your uh, personal journey with us. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Subhashri. Thank, Thank you, you Vidasta. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.